Adesanya. Hello and good day. We are so excited to uh, have some time together today. This uh, morning stream or stream, whatever time of day it is where you are, is coming to you from the Living Systems Art and Design Collaboratory in partnership with the Design Science Studio, which is of the Buckminster Fuller Institute and have ritual with the University of California, Irvine, uh, Emergent Media and Design Lab. So I'm gonna pass it to John, who's gonna introduce our wonderful and exciting guest speaker. Thank you so much for being with us today. Let's get started. Okay, hello everyone. My name is John Crawford. I'm a professor in the School of the Arts at University of California, Irvine. Uh, we're so thrilled to have Natalie Maipak as our guest and I'll be giving a brief introduction and then turning it over to Natalie for the talk today. The reason that we felt it was so important for all of the folks in the Living Systems Collaboratory and Design Science Studio and in the wider Buckminster Fuller uh, universe to learn more about Natalie is that her work connects with all of our key uh, areas of interest and study and creation in so many ways. Natalie works at the intersection of art and science and I think generally put you could say her work focuses on the visual articulation of scientific observations. I'm cribbing here from your artist statement Natalie. Um, she moves back and forth between multiple disciplines translating science data that relates to areas such as ecology, climate change and meteorology, meteor meteorology into three-dimensional structures. I won't tell you too much more about the details of her work but by looking at this wonderful um, array of materials behind her you'll see that Natalie works with all kinds of physical three-dimensional analog forms but then takes that through the metaphors of scientific visualization and the metaphors of artistic creation to create sculpture, music, and other things in wonderful ways that I'm so inspired by. So um, with that, I um, will turn it over to Natalie in just a minute. So uh, we're here at uh, around uh, 9.37 Pacific, 12.37 Eastern for Natalie at um, around 10.30 Pacific, 1.30 Eastern, or whatever time it is, wherever you are, folks, um, we'll be uh, setting up a Q&A session. Uh, due to technical limitations, we um, aren't able uh, to have Natalie see your comments directly, but anything you post in the chat, uh, either as comments um, on Facebook, YouTube, um, or directly on the stream, however you're uh, consuming it, we'll see those comments and then we'll bring them back for Natalie to uh, address in the Q&A se uh, section. But some of your comments will also appear in the live stream. So uh, feel free to comment, ask questions all the way through. We'll do our best to deal with all of the questions um, and uh, uh, any uh, remaining comments um, in about 50 minutes. Uh, but we'll also be putting your comments up and you'll be seeing them as the, as the stream progresses. So um, with that, uh, Natalie, are you ready? Great, I'll turn it over to Natalie and I'll see you all back um, in about 50 minutes. Thanks, Natalie, here we go. Uh, John, we can't hear Natalie's audio. Natalie, I'm so sorry. There is a problem with your audio. Let me just see if this works better. Um, Roxy, can you hear Natalie's audio now? Should I say something so she can oh, hear me? Oh, yes, yes. Now I can hear it. Okay. I'm sorry, everybody. I pushed the wrong button. So here we go. We'll um, bring Natalie back and ask you to start again, Natalie. Apologies for okay. the confusion. Okay, here we go. Take it away, Natalie. Okay, all right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, John has been amazing to create this link uh, today. It's, there's been uh, some technical issues. Welcome to my studio. I'm here in Boston where it's very, very cold and we're about to get snow. Um, I'm in my studio. It's This is where all my work starts, where it ends and all the messiness in between. And so I'm showing you actually the, the cleaned up side. You're not seeing the messy side. 
Um, I'm very excited to talk to you all today because in some ways I feel a real community here of mind minded, you know, like minded thinkers, collaborators, curious per people and uh, after talking to John more about the program and about what brings you all together, I wanted to focus my talk today on collaboration and how my practice from the very beginning was sort of based on that idea of collaborating. So I'm going to be sharing my screen with you um, and feel free to write any comments or, or questions in the chats and I'll get to those at the end since I'm a little bit, I can't really see any of you right now. So John's going to be my translator. So here I am sharing my screen and I hope that you can see that. Um, so my work always begins in the same way. It began about 20 years ago. And I think the reason I have been such a hybrid person is because I started this fairly late in my life. I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't until I was in my thirties that I really began to integrate art and science together. And I became a sculptor because of my interest in science. I would not be here right now in this art studio had I not been interested in science. So all of my work begins the same way. It begins with me extracting information from an environment, whether that's me building my own devices or me going to the internet and getting numbers from there, and then taking all of these numbers, translating them into woven sculptures or musical scores. At the very beginning, when I started this 20 years ago, art was in the service of science. It was very much about using artistic processes to understand science, to get a tactile, tactile understanding of what I was studying. As a, as a very tactile learner, I had to find some sort of way to, to break through the abstractness of science. But I think 20 years later now, it's less about art explaining science and it's much more about, um, it's much more about using art to get into the, the the narrative of narrative of the scientific phenomena that I'm looking at that a scientific graph has a harder time getting into. So the work is much more riddled with metaphor. It's much more about exploring inconsistencies and less about explaining anything. Though in some ways, this is the most important slide of my whole presentation. This is a Lego ad from the 1980s. And if I was in an auditorium, I would at this point ask all of you, how many of you played with construction toys when you were small? And about half of you would probably lift, lift your hands up, maybe more in this audience. And then I would ask you again, how many of you still do that? How many of you still have these Lego sets or construction toys or tinker toys and, and fiddle with them as, as you're thinking through? And many of you would still lift your, eye, lift your hand up. So Lego for me uh, from the very beginning wasn't just about building things, even though I had tons of them, I still have lots of them at home, but Legos was also a way of, of studying systems. So from the very beginning, when I was a kid, I would build these cities just like many other kids with these Lego sets. And I'd put little labels behind every one of my Lego people with the name and the profession they had. And so I would build these sort of social systems around these Lego sets. And then what my sister would come and destroy the whole thing for whatever reason. And then I'd have to re build not only the, the city itself, the structures, but also the systems that these structures in a sense create or inhabit. So to me, um, Legos or, or this tactile way of learning has been something that's been pretty fundamental to me as a learner from the beginning. But what I work with is information. So the, the, kind, of, the kind of stuff that is the beginning of every sculpture looks like this, graphs, maps, or, or um, any kind of spreadsheet is how I begin. From the very beginning, this studio practice was based on the idea of collaboration because from the very beginning, art and science were with me in the studio. As I mentioned, I became a sculptor because of my interest in science. And I'll share that journey with you in just a bit. Um, but I've also have continued collaborating, not just within these two disciplines, but also with lots of other people, scientists, teachers, oceanographers, composers, writers, anybody who works with data, I collaborate with. And it's not something that comes natural to me. And in many ways, 
after 20 years of collaborating with people, I've learned that I am a reluctant collaborator and also a recovering collaborator because I never find them easy to do. But I find them to be very, very necessary because that's the one thing that will force me to get out of my blinders and how I think about data, how I work with data and uh, what else I can, what, what, where the potential lies with working with this material. So one of the things that I've learned with 20 years of collaborations is that there are certain things that I need for a collaboration to work for me. And I found that one of the elements that I need in any collaboration is privacy, that somewhere in this collaboration, uh, whether it begins with the kitchen table and all of us kind of sharing ideas together, there has to be some time in that, in that collaboration process, a point where I can retreat into my own studio and think about the problem myself. So I've learned over the years what to ask for in a collaboration to make it more successful next time around. My work looks very playful. And when people look at my work or they come into my studio, they oftentimes think it's for children because it's very colorful. It's, you know, lots of, lots of primary colors, lots of references to construction toys. And all of that is very deliberate because when you spend more time looking at this, you know, colorful cacophony, you begin to notice little tags that say temperature readings or wind readings or maybe um, a pressure reading. And you'll begin to realize that underneath that visual chaos is actually a numerical logic that's holding it together. The use of this very playful language is very deliberate. I'm trying to lure people into the information I'm using without immediately telling them that it's based on science. Because I find that if you um, immediately tell uh, audiences that this is based on scientific data, the shutters go down and no one wants to engage with it. So it's a way of luring people into these into this complexity of numbers through the lens of play. When I'm in the studio, I walk into this daily contradiction. And it's one of the reasons why I love what I do. Because on one hand, as a craftsperson who uses basket weaving as my main method of translation, I know that if I really want to understand this material and this process, I have to fail with it a hundred, a thousand times. I have to break it, twist it, burn it, sit on it, melt it. I have to cut it up. I have to really, really let it fail in order to really understand where the parameters lie for this material. Well, if you use that kind of language with data and you say, I'm going to break it, twist it, play with it, melt it, contort it, you find yourself very quickly in murky territory because then data becomes impure and is data still data or what is data once you start translating it into something other than it's the way that we usually confront data with which is through the numbers or through through some sort of scientific graph and so i'm interested in that contradiction that that to fail with the material or the craft process is is encouraged and is is very much needed but when you take that kind of language with with working with data you find yourself uh, into a very, very murky territory very quickly. And I love that. One of the things that I've found that I'm very interested in is not so much in explaining weather or explaining climate change, which are the two subjects, subjects that I've focused on predominantly for the last 15 years. But I'm much more interested in how humans respond to these events because a scientific instrument is like a metronome. It can measure things very accurately. Every, every minute, every second, I can get the temperature or pressure readings of a certain location. But the way that humans respond to these events are not always rational. And I'm very interested in that response. In 2014, I came across this really interesting essay by Zadie Smith in the New York Review of Books called The Elegy for a Country Season. Mm -hmm. And in it, she writes, that there is a scientific and ideological language for what's happening to the weather, but there are hardly any intimate words. And I think that's very true. Um, weather used to be this icebreaker that you talked about when you're in the elevator, you know, sharing a few minutes with a stranger. And now weather has become so tightly connected to climate change that it's harder and harder for people to talk about it. And yet so many of us are affected by extreme weather patterns on a daily basis, if not at some point during our, our lives. So how can we develop a dialogue about what's happening to our environment without polarizing that discussion always um, between the scientific and the political um, kind of polar regions? And so what she's asking for is for a more diverse 
uh, range of of languages that we bring in metaphor that we bring in analogies that we bring in the arts to, in order to dig into that more nuanced response that humans have to climate change and weather so i wanted to share with you kind of my working process by just um giving you an example of how how i have worked with a recent hurricane so i did a show in houston um in 2019 and it was on Hurricane Harvey. And so this was two years after Hurricane Harvey happened. And one of the reasons why I like working with uh, hurricanes in particular is because hurricanes reveal things that are very interesting to me in different communities. Hurricanes respond, um, different communities respond very differently to natural disasters. In some uh, communities, communities will just simply try to rebuild and try to bring it back to what it was before the hurricane. Other times, communities take this as an opportunity to rethink their urban strategies, their their inequities that have been revealed through um, through the hurricane, uh, social structures, and so forth. So every hurricane reveals different weaknesses within the social, political, and economic fabric of any kind of um, urban environment. So I'm interested in these in these events for that reason, and also because even though a hurricane is this incredible meteorological event that comes through um, a location last maybe a day, sometimes a week, the aftermath of that lingers for years after. So it's not a story that ends um, once the news media leaves, it's a story that lingers for many, many years. So Hurricane Harvey, just as a review, happened in August, 2017. And uh, it marched to the Gulf of Mexico and then slammed into Southeast Texas and then lingered over Houston, dumped a ton of rain and then went back out into the ocean and then came back on land in Southwestern Louisiana. And what's interesting here was that this was a very slow moving uh, storm so that it had time to dump over 50 inches of rain over Houston. And what is 50 inches of rain? 50 inches of rain is 27 trillion gallons of water. So if you put it all into a get, into a drop, this is this is the drop of water that was being dumped on Houston. Not all at once over a period of a week, but still that's a significant amount of water. And that little kind of area in the in the with all the high rises, that's the downtown area. Um, so one of the first things that I do when a hurricane happens is I go on and f go to the internet and I try to find as much data as I can, uh, weather data, hurricane data, ocean data, but I also pay attention to what the local media is, is uh, talking about. So how do these local television stations transform themselves into these SOS centers and relay you know, uh, exactly what's going on in the city? I also become a kind of data hoarder. I just start collecting anything that has to do even tangentially with Hurricane Harvey. And what I'm looking for in these in this kind of data mining search is any kind of traction to a story that I find interesting because I don't want to just throw data at people. That's not really telling a story with data. I want to somehow connect the data to the human experience. So I just spend a lot of time looking and and waiting for this traction to come about and with harvey i spent about three months just looking through um, newspaper articles maps data sets and so forth and one of the things that i kept finding again and again was that a lot of the maps used the houston highway system as a kind of visual anchor which makes sense houston is very much an, an, a car city and they use this sort of visual, you know, you have the inner beltway and the outer beltway, and then the highways kind of spiraling out. Um, use it to showcase different aspects uh, or different data sets connected to Hurricane Harvey. So this is the medium household income of Houston. Uh, this is FEMA uh, structures that have been damaged uh, that that have been assessed by FEMA, where these where the damages were were um, uh, located, Superfund sites that were flooded or not flooded during Harvey, uh, where the debris pickup happened, where the rescues happened. So just an accumulation of data sets. And what I'm looking for is that one visualization, that one newspaper article that makes a link between, an analyt between the analytical side of data and the human experience of it. 
And this particular one really hit home with me. And that was sort of what got me and uh, got me the traction I needed to then do my first work. So I'm going to click on this link and hope that you can see this. This is a visualization of Twitter messages that were sent out during Hurricane Harvey when the 911 system failed. And what you'll see is you'll see the area of Houston and these red dots popping up. That's where Twitter messages were sent and the kind of messages that they contained. You'll see that on Monday, there's a lot of action in Houston. This will slow down after a while because the storm is going back out into the ocean and then it'll pick up on the right side near the Beaumont area with more tweets. What I loved about this visualization was that it made an, a very strong link between the analytical side of the data where these tweets were coming from, but also the messages of, of SOS that they contained. And if you didn't see, um, if you couldn't read those Twitter messages, these are some of the Twitter messages that were sent out. No water or, or no food or water, flooded out of the home, nausea from lack of oxygen, neck deep in water. So these are Twitter messages that people send uh, for many of them, this is, they were probably fearing for their lives. So this is when, to me, the traction begins. And usually the next step is to take all that data and put it into some sort of visual format that lets me start editing down what exactly I wanna say with that data. So the first thing I did here was create a kind of map of the highway system that integrates where the flooding happened. So the gray areas, the kind of fainted areas are the highway system. Then the big red dots are the Twitter messages. The, the little tags on the side are some of the Twitter messages. The, um, the bars are how much rain fell. And then the, the kind of smaller squares are wind reading. So I just kind of compile things that I want to bring into the story, into this two-dimensional picture. And this two-dimensional picture actually becomes a musical score. So then I use that musical score and create and start making three-dimensional pieces out of it. So this is an example of a piece I did where um, you see sort of an inner square that's a quilt that translates all that information I just showed you from those maps. And then the outer, the sort of more sculptural components on the outer side, talk about flooding events that have impacted uh, Houston that are not necessarily driven by Harvey. So one of the things that it's really interesting to me about the Harvey story was that Harvey dumped an awful lot of rain onto Houston, but this is not the only reason why Houston flooded so badly. Houston also flooded badly because it had for the last previous 10 years, really bad building codes where people could basically pave over anything they wanted and build. So there was nowhere for the water to go. Water, uh, Houston is sort of a, this bowl. And so the water just kind of sat there. So the hurricane wasn't, only bad because it was a lot of rain, but it also revealed a lot of weaknesses within the infrastructure and within the um, urban planning strategies in the last uh, 10 years. So just to kind of get closer, the quilt itself uh, is made up of the medium income map, the flooding points, the, the Twitter messages, the shelters, the super fun sites. And then around that quilt is this other story about communities in, um, in Houston basically rebuilding after every flooding event, whether it's caused by Harvey or some other smaller flooding event. And then the sort of repackaging of these homes back to where they were into these sort of Home Depot-like structures. And then this wheel here translates weather data from Hurricane Harvey. So it's sort of a compilation of lots of data in one piece. The next step that I oftentimes do is I take that score that I was showing you earlier and I work with musicians and composers to translate that information into an audible piece. Because the point is to find as many ways of, of reaching or as many ways of, of uh, re-understanding uh, re data in a new way. And uh, by inviting musicians into the process, I'm hoping to expand the conversation of how data can be used as a creative 
material. So for this performance, uh, we did a concert at Denison University in 2019 with Ethel, which is a um, musical group from New York City. And, for, and uh, we decided to divide the, the gallery space in which I had an exhibition into the highway system of Houston. So everybody sort of sits in this weird circular formation that in a very rough way replicates the highway system of Houston. And then every one of these people that are sitting in there got a little piece of paper before they entered the space, which contained one of the Twitter messages of the hurricane. And so what we did is we basically uh, performed the score that I just showed you. And I'm gonna show you the clip now and I'm hoping the feet's gonna be okay. It's a very screechy piece, so um, get ready. It's gonna be a little bit screechy, but just to kind of um, prepare you a little bit for it. It's a six minute piece and you'll see it starting. The video starts with um, Dorothy sitting in the middle of the gallery. She plays the cello and she plays a melodic piece, just a very short phrase, that represents the city and she kind of gets more and more frantic as the water rises. The other three musicians come from the sides and represent the storm coming in and they are going to weave in and out in and out of the audience and become louder and louder and at some point when the muse when the lights go down you'll hear these voices in the background and that's the audience being invited to read these twitter messages. And this is kind of a perfect example of a collaboration that we had no idea whether this would work, whether people would be game for this, whether um, you know this sort of impromptu work uh, with weaving in and out would work. But um, if you if you watch the video to the very end, I think it really comes together really beautifully. So let me go to the next slide and then um, show you the, the video. And if if it's really too painful, if the feed's not good. Uh, Please, John, let me know so I can stop it. I don't want to force anyone to listen to this if it's painful. Oh, excuse me.
pregnant. I'm starting to feel ill. John, for some reason we can't hear you. That's again. great. Oh, now you're back. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> what what really what I loved about this performance uh, is how afterwards we got into this wonderful conversation with the audience about hurricanes, about climate change, about data about what it's like to work with data from a musician's perspective from a sculptor's perspective what it was it like for them to participate in this piece so the conversation was really really rich and i think part of it had to do with uh this this performance would really everybody was engaged in it everybody was invited to be part of it and none of it really was planned so that's the other part about collaboration is that it always just you just always have to trust a little bit that in the end it's going to lead to a conversation at least the good ones do so now let me kind of reel back and give you a bit of a uh, of a background into why how did I end up where I am and why am I doing this? And in a lot of ways, it starts with the Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, I came to this country, I speak with a bit of an accent, which you probably have heard already. Um, I came to this country when I was 12 because my father worked uh, on the Hubble Space Telescope for over 25 years. He was an engineer who worked on one of the cameras. So we had Hubble Space Telescope stuff all over the house. The, it, it was just everywhere, models, pictures, everything. So I, I was w always around this, but um, as a true teenager, I really took absolutely no interest whatsoever in the science uh, of it. And instead, 20 years later, I found myself taking astronomy classes uh, at Harvard Night School in their night school division in astronomy, because I think a lot of that, that being surrounded by space did sort of come back to me. And I'm so glad I did because uh, taking that class was one of the most uh, profound things that happened to me. Astronomy is an amazing science. Uh, and 
one of the things that I was really interested in was how incredibly abstract it felt to me as a tactile learner. So it happened that at the same time, serendipity, I was taking a basket weaving class just down the road. So I would find myself going to this lecture every night about you know, the deepest of space and time, which is astronomy, with my, with my, you know, with my bucket, my sprayer, my reed hanging out, and just listening to this incredible science that I was studying. And I was struck with how everything was so flat in astronomy. You can't touch anything in astronomy. You can't jump into a little spaceship and, and take a 3D tour of the solar system. So I decided that um, when I when you know the class was progressing and we're learning about quasar stars and and neutron stars and we're going way away you know black holes and all that i was still really kind of interested in okay let me start with our with our little neighborhood and try to figure out if i can find a three-dimensional tactile way of understanding that spatial relationship the sun the moon and the earth and so um i did a lot of trying to figure out how i can use a tactile way of you know breaking through this. And I ended up breaking through with through the, the 3D world by taking the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is a beautiful diagram in astronomy. It looks at the surface temperature and luminosity of every star. And based on these two values, you can figure out whether a star is dying, whether it is middle age, or whether it is, it is uh, just a, a newborn. And there is, a, there is such simplicity in that diagram that is so beautiful that I really wanted to focus on that diagram. And so for our final paper in the class, I decided to not write a paper, but make a sculpture out of this diagram. So I took this diagram, literally made it into a three-dimensional donut and turned it in. So this donut that you see is about three, three feet across, three feet in, in diameter, and just turned it in. And it's basically a three-dimensional version of that Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And I handed it to the professor and I have to say, it takes one open-minded person to sometimes give you the thumbs up in your unconventional way of thinking because he didn't blink an eye when I handed him this big basket as opposed to a written paper. But what this did, it, it really kind of opened up my mind. Like, okay, so what can I, else can I use the basket for other than making these 3D versions of, of graphs? So I started to go back to this idea of, okay, let's look back into our little neighborhood, the sun, the moon, and the earth, and just try to figure out how can I use just that, that very small spatial relationship in you know, the scale of the, uh, of the universe to try to figure out some sort of three-dimensional way. So I looked at a lot of calendars, solar calendars, lunar calendars, and the more numerical they were, the easier they were for me to work with. So I started to go back to the basket and say, okay, if this basket is a three-dimensional grid, basically, you have vertical elements and horizontal elements. And I'm translating this data that you see here on the right, which is moon and sun data. And I'm just came from Antarctica because I was looking at a lot of polar regions. And so I'm looking at when the moon is up in the sky and the sun is up in the sky. And when the and the way I start is I basically assign every pair of vertical elements an hour of each day. So I have 48 spokes or a 24 hour uh, cycle. I have a clock basically. And then I simply weave when the moon is up in the sky, I start weaving the flat reed. And when the sun is up in the sky, I start weaving the round reed. And what I found over time is that if you do this over time, you see these really weird warps that are coming about. And reed is a material that I cannot fully control. If I exert too much pressure on reed, it will break. And so what that allows me to do is it allows me to let the numbers dictate the form. So in this case, I'm translating more data. I'm looking at June to October, the first day of sunlight in June to the first day of 24 hour sunlight in, in October. And I'm using the same 24 hour cycle. I'm using a little bit more data now. I'm lo looking at moon data, twilight data, and sun data. And so these warps that you see that are coming about in this form, that's the numbers that are distorting this grid of the basket. So once I have this three-dimensional form, I basically have a three-dimensional calendar that I can then use to plot more inf information on top. So I can put in the low tide readings, high tide readings, moon phases, and so forth. Here's another piece, um, Boston Tides. This is a fairly large piece. This is about, I'd say about six feet in diameter in each direction. So the inner part, the basket part, uses the same 24 hour cycle, uses sun and moonrise data to create this, this sort of basket body 
And again, the contortions you see, that's the numbers that are twisting the, the grid. Then I can also put on daily high and daily high and low tide readings. I can put noon, solar noon and moon phases, as well as the solar azimuth for six, 12 months, which is the solar azimuth is the highest point of the sun in the sky in relationship to the horizon. And what I was finding with these pieces is that they're very awkward because if you place this piece in a science museum, people will read this piece as a title chart. You, piece it, you put it in a craft museum, it will begin this whole conversation about basketry and utilitarian functions of basketry. And you put it in an art museum and it becomes this aesthetic object. So it was, it was kind of awkward. It was forcing people to think, well, what am I looking at? Am I looking at science? Am I looking at craft? Am I looking at art? What is this thing? And I liked how uncomfortable it, it made people. And this discomfort is something that I have tried to hold on to because I, I think it's a very powerful element. I was also at the time making a lot of devices to help me survey things. So I made, for example, this Antarctic surveying device that is made entirely out of data that would that you know theoretically I could take to Antarctica and put it somewhere in the vast whiteness of Antarctica, plot it down, and with this device I can figure out where um, where along the calendar I was, whether it was March or or May or where I was, just using the sun and the moon. And so it's very precise, but it's also of course incredibly absurd because this thing wouldn't survive five seconds in an environment. So. Another element that was coming through in the work quite early on was absurdity. And just the fact that these pieces were whimsical and absurd, but that seemed to be part of the way they were kind of growing together with the data. And I kind of held on to that. After grad school, I found myself uh, on Cape Cod, which is this peninsula in Southeastern Massachusetts, it sort of juts out into the Atlantic. And I was there for a residency. And it was up to then, I'd always been working with other people's data. And I wanted to see, well, what happens if I'm the one that collects data? How does that change the way I understand sculpture? How does it change the way I, I translate the information? So the first thing I had to do was figure out how to actually collect data. So for two years, I went to Herring Cove Beach, this one particular place on Cape Cod, and I would collect information. And I would go to the hard, local hardware store and get any, any device that I could think of that would measure things. So the kitchen aisle, I got the thermometer, the rain gauge from the garden aisle, super low tech. I would build my own data collecting devices as well. And there are two things I learned in that time. First, how hard it is to get really good data, that data collecting is, you have to be incredibly disciplined because it's one thing to do this when it's 70 degrees. It's another thing when it's 32 and you have a 30 mile northerly wind. So it takes a lot of dedication and it's very hard to get good data. A second thing is the importance of slowness. There's nothing fast about weather observing. You don't understand anything about weather if all you ever do is look at an app. Weather is an interaction with an environment. So to really understand how weather, weather exists, you have to, to observe an environment for, uh, you know, for quite a long time for that interaction to reveal itself. So even after 18 months, I felt like I barely understood how weather was interacting on Cape Cod. When I was on the beach, it wasn't just about measuring data and about collecting numbers. It was also about observing my environment. So what was going on? What sort of um, clouds, what was the cloud formation? What was the color of the water? What sort of stuff was washing up on the shore? What was the sound like? Sound is different in certain, depending on the pressure. And so there were all these variations and it was, it was the numbers and the observations together that really helped me um, break through some of the, these, these data sets and try to make some pieces out of it. So all the data was collected compared to local weather stations to make sure my instruments were calibrated right. And then I would collect these um, clipboards and every one of these clipboards is a sculpture in process, basically. Eventually, these uh, data sets turn into sculptures. This is a piece I did on warm winter. So a period of warm winter in on Cape Cod and two months worth using the same kind of 24 hour cycle principle that you saw earlier. This is a piece looking at temperature variations over a four month period. And a series of pieces I did on um, 
using ocean buoys and trying to understand why right whales were hanging out in certain sections of, of the Atlantic and using the buoy data to sort of follow their journey in these different areas and try if the buoy data could tell me something about why they like why they like to hang out in the Bay of Fundy so much in late June, uh, in late summer. But all of these pieces were very much still geared towards answering specific questions about science. And I'm forwarding a little bit quicker now um, because one of the things that was starting to happen was that I was starting to feel with these early pieces that when people saw these pieces and they knew they were driven by data that there was the sort of, oh, okay, the sculpture explains to me something. Great, I can learn something. And it sort of, I felt like it was shutting the conversation off too quickly, that there was so much potential in the sculpture becoming part of the conversation that everything, all the focus was driven, all the focus was, was pointed towards the numbers, not really on what the sculpture, the form itself, the metaphors it might suggest could bring into the conversation of this data. And so it was also at that point where I started to become more and more interested in not just how instruments, whether instruments collect data, but how we respond to that data in a sense. So I started to look at hurricanes and how hurricanes act as a meteorological event, but also how they, how they are processed uh, as a human experience, as a community experience, uh, as a you know, national global experience and how messy those responses can be. And the first storm that I tried this on was with Hurricane Sandy. And I focused particularly on these amusement park rides that were destroyed by Hurricane Sandy. And so I made these rides that translated data from this night that Hurricane Sandy hit the, the New Jersey or New York shoreline. But imbued in these pieces are also other sculptural elements that try to bring in another narrative of what what amusement parks in the future might look like if we keep building them right on on the on the seashore so this is the last ride the last ride is sandy she's the she's the dragon up there taking the last ride but the roller coaster itself is actually a three-dimensional graph that you can read um, to find out what the conditions were doing sandy this is another one where i combined data from um coney island and new jersey Seaside Heights, uh, it's a roller coaster on the bottom, Seaside Heights, Coney Island, the Wonder Wheel on the top. It's all a data, you can read the data off of Hurricane Sandy that night. But the whole thing is also floating on water. So is this how our future amusement parks are gonna look like? So it's trying to bring in a kind of darker futuristic narrative. In the back of the Wonder Wheel is a Wheel of Fortune that you can spin to find out how many houses are gonna be underwater depending on how high sea level rises. And this kind of um, more, I think, messiness, I guess, uh, or muddiness that I was trying to bring in with these amusement park rides was also coming into a larger pieces. This is a piece that I made that's on that is about um, that is about flooding events that have taken place in Louisiana since Hurricane Katrina. So hurricanes, we tend to think of hurricanes as these you know, very distinct chapters, Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irma. But communities don't, don't respond to them like that when a community is usually hit with a variety of flooding events. And in um, Louisiana in particular, there were four flooding events that I was focusing on and different kinds of flooding events from hurricanes to sea level rise to river flooding. So this is a piece I did on four flooding events that happened in Louisiana. It's called Build Me a Platform High in the Trees So I May See the Waters, which is of course ironic because the waters are coming to you. You don't have to build a high platform. Um, so in this case, the way I created this composition, which is essentially a map of uh, that incorporates location elements of all of these different um, meteorological events. So if you see the sort of diagonal line that kind of juts through it, that's the Mississippi River. Anything above the Mississippi River, including the wheel, is a map of, Louis of um, New Orleans. The kind of clusters of houses at the bottom left are um, communities in Baton Rouge. And then uh, these pillars on the lower right are um, 
gas pillars of the Mississippi Delta below New Orleans. So obviously the geography is a little bit mixed up, but um, composition wise, it makes sense. So this composition was created by first starting with looking at the data that I was looking at and then starting off not immediately with translating it into a structure, into a physical structure, but starting with a sound map. So here's a um, sound map, I'm going to call it that, that takes these four events, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, which was, you know, a big hurricane, big storm surge, Mississippi River flooding in 2017, which was sort of a recurring flooding event, but that was very, very dramatic and, and terrible in 2017. A Baton Rouge uh, rain event where it never developed into any kind of a system that would, would that would get a name like a hurricane. It was just one week of just straight rain that caused enormous amount of flooding. And then sea level rise in the very southern part of Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana has some of the, the high, quickest, highest sea level rise uh, in anywhere in the on the globe. And so I was using these four different events and starting to try to figure out how this can be changed into movement or sound so the first i started with movement so with these four events okay so a movement a, a um hurricane is circular it's cyclical it's it's you know you can sort of imagine the revving the, the formation of a hurricane the mississippi was wavy and moderate baton rouge was linear because it was this constant accumulating rain that just kept dripping and dripping dripping over a week and then the Grand Isle, these very stationary pillars that slowly are sinking into the ground because of sea level rise. Then I also brought in volume. You know, the, the storm surge was fast and low rise. The Mississippi was this constant up and up and down flowing. And then the Baton Rouge was this moderate, consistent rain, like dropped up, dropped up. And then the Grand Isle was this very slow rise. And these were just quick sketches of figuring out how I can compose this. And this these sketches were really the foundation of this of this piece. And this leads me to the last bit I want to talk about, which is the weather score project that I started, in which I, I began to integrate musical notation. And as you can probably already tell from that sound map that I just showed you, I am not a musician. I don't play any instrument. I can't read music. So going into musical notation was about as naive as one can, can be and jumping into, you know, a, a pool and not knowing how deep it is. And, but I think naivete is a very powerful partner sometimes to have in the studio because you end up making very courageous decisions without realizing that you're being courageous at all. You're just sort of trying to figure something out. And the reason I chose musical notation is because I wanted to find a way of bringing a nuance of information without changing the information. And very naively, I thought, well, if you can take a melody and just sort of change the notation system around the melody and make you can make that melody sound happy or sad or sporadic or or confused just by the notation system around it. Well, I've learned since then it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that was sort of the initial reason behind it. Can I bring in emotions without changing the data? So the pieces would start with me collecting data from an environment, transposing it into a visual matrix that can be read as a score. Notice I'm not necessarily calling them scores because some musicians would take issue with that. A visual matrix that can be read as a score. And then I give the score to composers or musicians and I use the same score to build sculptures with. These sculptures now are not just translating the weather data, but they also now have to function as three-dimensional scores that can be played. So out of this came the Weather Score project in which I have now, we've had over 15 concerts with composers and musicians all over the country, also in Canada, where I work with these collaborative projects where um, musicians, composers, and I start with the same base material, these musical scores based on data. This is the first score I wrote. This is a score uh, about a um, a death in the family. I wanted to see if I can write a musical score about something about as something about as dramatic as that, the death in the family. So this is a score that is built entirely out of weather data. 
everything comes from my weather station. The only subjective thing are these black kind of lines. These are the tempo lines of what time really felt like during that grieving process. This is um, about the death of my father-in-law from the day that we heard about his death to his funeral. And so that, that week, which is basically a week of just grieving and trying to come to terms with it. And then I would take that score and everything on here is weather data. So all the dots are either temperature or pressure or wind direction. <laughs> and then I would work with incredibly patient and skilled musicians to interpret these scores. And then I would build these into the and use the same score to build these these uh, sculptures. So you can see how the sculptures are now changing. They're much more transparent because you're, you have to be able to read the score as you move around the sculpture. So this has led to, and the more I've worked with musicians, the more the, the scores or the visual matrix has changed, the more I've learned what works and what doesn't work because these visual matrices have to work both for musicians and for myself. These scores are, they usually have two elements in them. I know I'm going over time a little bit, but let me just finish this, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, there's two elements that I try to include in all of these scores. One of them is boredom. Because if you played this, this is a graph of Hurricane Noel. It shows you pressure, wind, and temperature. And if you were to literally, um, so basically what I did is I took this graph, I plunked it onto a piano keyboard, incredibly crude. So that column that you see on the left with these kind of bl black and white um, bricks, that's a piano keyboard. So this is how low tech this is. And if you were to play exactly these notes on the keyboard, you would you can hear exactly what's going to happen. It's incredibly boring. The other element that I try to include is uh, because hurricanes deal with extremes, oftentimes the 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 notes stretch over six, sometimes eight octaves. So how do musicians deal with these parameters? How do they deal with how do they make this sound interesting? How do they make this? How do they tell the story of the hurricane without staying totally on script and how do they still retain the integrity of, of the data and then i would go and build a score or a sculpture out of this uh, and that's hurricane well and just to kind of give you a quick snip of what that sounds like here is a snippet of that score Okay, I'm going to skip over this. This is as you know, my work with musicians evolved. The 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 way the 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 scores looked changed. This is Hurricane Maria, that led to this kind of piece. But I want to end with this piece because it's one of my favorites. Um, this is a score that I wrote about um, the perfect storm, and uh, which is a 1991 weather event that took place, and it's the story of a shipping vessel that sank during the storm. And one of the things I love about working with composers is that you never know where they find traction with these pieces. Uh, some really stick to the data and some really like ethical that you saw in the performance go into a totally different interpretive mode. And I've learned to stay open to all of this because it's not about, a collaboration is not about wanting to hear what I wanna hear, but it's about hearing something new. This piece uh, is about um, the, the ship is, this is about the night that the ship is sinking during the perfect storm. And all the data on here is pressure and wind. And um, Matthew Jackford is a West Virginian composer who wrote this piece. And he was really interested in the kind of random notes that this data was creating on the keyboard. You see this keyboard again on the, on the left here. And so you hear in this interpretation a lot of da 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 da. So that's the wind that he is that he's replicating. At the very end, you'll hear a violin coming in. That violin plays a fishing shanty that talks about a shipwreck that took place in the very same area that the Andrew Gale, the ship that sank during the 
perfect storm also sank. So it's sort of entering this other narrative of shipwrecks in this particular location of the ocean. So we'll play this for about a minute and then I'll open it up for questions. Sorry for going over. So again, this piece was by Matthew Jackford. I don't know if I put his name on the last slide, so I apologize for that. Um, so I wanna, this is gonna be my last slide. I guess I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna unshare myself here now. So um, thank you very much for listening and, uh, and watching, I guess. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have uh, about what you saw or collaborations or interdisciplinary, whatever. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was truly inspiring. And uh, for those of you who are just joining us or joined us recently, we've been uh, in the middle of a wonderful exploration on the poetry of data with Natalie Maybach, who is uh, an artist and scholar who explores the intersection of art and science by translating scientific data in areas such as meteorology, ecology, oceanography, into woven sculptures, which are then interpreted as musical scores and become parts of installations. And uh, she's the recipient of numerous awards and residencies, including a Paula Krasner Award, a TED Global Fellowship, and many others. Her work has been shown in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia. And uh, we're so grateful that you can be here with us today, Natalie. This, by the way, is the uh, Living Systems Collaboratory. Uh, which is a, a new program that provides funding for artists and designers to support the development of creative projects that explore living systems. At the moment, we have almost 30 designers and artists working with us to design projects that aid people in perceiving the biological, cognitive, social, ecological, philosophical, spiritual, mathematical, political, and technological dimensions of life as a unified whole as inspired by Living Systems. My name is John Crawford. I have the great honor to be one of the co-founders of the Living Systems Collaboratory, which is um, operated by the Buckminster Fuller Institute in partnership with the Design Science Studio and the University of California, Irvine, where I also have the great good fortune to be a professor. So with that, we um, will open it up for questions. Natalie, I want to say at the outset that there have been dozens and dozens of really appreciative comments. I'm sorry that uh, due to the technical limitations, you weren't able to see them, but we'll share them with you um, later. Uh, I think your, um, your uh, approach, um, your work, and certainly your engagement with the material and the, the world around all of us really uh, struck a wonderful chord with um, many of our um, participants and guests. 
So let's kick it off with a question from Natalia who asks, did you ever experience a discomfort of not fitting into an art mold or a science mold specifically? Or did you always thrive in the feedback of not belonging to one or the other? Yeah, I've never felt uh, that I belonged in either of these or any of these camps. And I'm, I'm deliberately trying to remain there. I really like living, I, I really like placing my work on the on the edge of something because I think that's where that's where we start to become aware of our own uh, prejudices. We become aware of our own blinders, of our own um, uh, uh, expectations. And I think this is sort of, especially with data, I think that's where some really interesting conversations can be. It's right on the edge of, of something. And I also think that we've just become such a cross-disciplinary breed. I, I can't really... I have a hard time sort of thinking of myself as an artist, as a, I'm, I don't think of myself as a scientist, but it's, it's sort of one type of working or functioning in one type of niche. I mean, especially COVID has also brought up all sorts of new adaptation modes <laughs> that go beyond the art and science for me as well. To me, it feels like your work um, could be regarded as transdisciplinary, where it's not so much a matter of simply working with people from different disciplines or even, you know, learning different disciplines, learning the vocabularies of others. But really, you are working in a way where you are creating new disciplines uh, along with your collaborators by means of your work with them. So th thinking of that, thinking of transdisciplinarity, what can you tell us about, uh, can you give us any advice or suggestions about how to approach this transdisciplinary adventure that many of us are on? Yeah, I think, well, I think the most important thing is listening and uh, just listening to uh, the other person or whoever you're working with uh, and being open to things not necessarily you know, turning out the way that you expected them. I think the most the most successful collaborations have been those where I do not know everything I need to know, where I am also there. I'm not an expert and I'm working with other people who are expert in their field, but they're, they're not expert in my field, for example. And uh, so I think a willingness to be wrong, uh, uh, really listening and and just a willingness to play with the outcome. Who, and it's I mean, I've been in so many collaborations where I've hated the outcome and you're not seeing them in this presentation, <laughs> but I think you have to take that risk because you never, ever know what's going to come out of a collaboration and you learn what to not to do with the next one, I guess. So uh, jumping on to that um, feeling of playfulness, which sometimes helps and sometimes we can't achieve. Um, your work sometimes has a feeling of kind of a whimsical uh, aspect to it. Maybe it's the the ephemeralness of the the basket and the reeds and the form, as you mentioned at the outset. Can you talk about how you approach creating a sense of balance when weaving together these whimsical approaches and materials with the abject terror that can come along with natural disaster from a human perspective? Is there ever a tipping point where a piece becomes too macabre as you dive into the research? Um, I haven't yet found that tipping point but I think every piece tries, I, I try to get closer to that point in some ways. Uh, I, I really, um, I like the playfulness because it, it, it disarms the viewer at the beginning. And so the viewer um, sees this work, they are reminded of toys, they're reminded of games, the colors. So they enter the narrative, I think, in a much more open way. And then, yes, you're right. Then the sort of horror of, of, of the disaster comes out. And I try to kind of use that, that, sh that shock to bring in metaphors about what future narratives might look like. Um, I think I do love absurdity. And I, I, I think the way that we are responding to climate change is absurd. And so part of using this playfulness is to accentuate that absurdity. So the last piece I did for, um, for Houston, uh, for the Hurricane mm -hmm. Harvey series was, um, 
was a piece that was about gambling and it was all about gambling with the future. And uh, so there were all these amusement parks and all these um, gambling games that were based on climate change data. And you as the viewer are the gambler. So yeah, it's absurd, but I think it, it sort of worked really well in, in encouraging or in, in I think in, in exploring this idea that um, we are part of that absurdity that we're creating. Um, have you, uh, I, I realized that in your work, you have honored the voices of disaster survivors or victims, for example, with the amazing text messages in the Harvey piece. In what other ways have you worked or engaged with uh, disaster survivors as part of your work? Yeah, one of uh, one of my favorite ways to work with uh, disaster survivors is to work with kids. Uh, I did this project with the National Science Foundation uh, a year ago um, on Hurricane Florence, and I went down to North Carolina and worked with three of the poorest rural counties, and in these county that were very hard hit by flooding, and then working with um, middle school uh, middle school students both in music and in art and engaging them in a conversation of what, how they experienced Hurricane Florence and, and how they, and many of them were still living either with relatives because the house was flooded um, or they were still living in temporary housing. So I think those are the projects that are the most meaningful when it's not just about learning about how different communities respond to um, natural disasters, but giving giving them an opportunity to, to actually digest some of this. A lot of these students had never actually made an art piece about this event that had taken place a year prior to this. So it was this really, it was this release. It was really astounding how much they wanted to do this project together. And it was a group project. So those are, those are the kind of projects I love, I love doing because they feel they feel very necessary. And I think also, especially because this was a rural area, um, you know, a lot of the news media in, in terms of looking at how communities uh, respond to hurricanes or natural disasters and what the aftermath and the rebuilding is like focuses on urban environments, but rural environments oftentimes don't get the resources that these urban centers get. And so even with Hurricane Florence, that even though it was a year after the storm hit, you could still drive through the countryside and see just debris and debris that was left over from Hurricane Florence. So those are the projects that are really meaningful to me. And I'd love to do more of those. Um, we're nearing the end of our time, but we did get a bit of a late start. Do you have uh, five or 10 minutes more to spend with us? Uh, there's lots more questions. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, so um, another question uh, relates to your, your use and your engagement with data. Um, obviously, a big part of the data is knowing what to leave in and what to leave out. There's always more data than you could ever, any of us could ever process. And, and maybe in cases where there are conflicts between the data, um, maybe the visualization could go either way. Can you tell us a bit about your process of how you choose data, how you disambiguate, how you resolve conflicts uh, in the data itself as you approach the art making part of it? Sure. So first of all, it's a conversation uh, between the data and the sculpture. So it never just starts data collecting, then I have my pile and now I have to turn over to the sculpture. It's a back and forth. So I begin with data. I start translating that into a sculptural form. Then the sculptural form might suggest things that I haven't even thought about in terms of bringing in the data. So I might go back to the research, go back to the sculpture, go to the score there and the score sometimes gets involved in there as well. Um, so it's a conversation between the two. And um, one of the things that I've always been very, um, that's always been very important to me is that I cannot change data for any kind of aesthetic purpose. So for example, if 25 mile an hour wind would really look a lot better on the sculpture than 15 mile an hour wind, can I just fudge it? So I, I, I can't do that. I don't fudge data for aesthetic purposes because I do want the integrity of the data to still be in there. I still want you to be able to read the weather off these pieces. So if a visual uh, translation 
doesn't work. Either it looks too busy or, you know, it really, it's not gelling. Then I have to find another way of, another way of translating the information visually while still staying true to the data. Uh, so there is, there is this, back and forth between the data and the sculpture. But at the end of the day, I have to create a visual complexity that resonates. I can't just make a mess. So I also have to kind of look at the overall visual structure of the piece. So then that comes into it too. And that's usually, when things get too busy visually, that's usually when I stop. So you've given us a, a really great survey of your process, your approaches, some really great examples of your work. Um, what's current for you? What, what, what's your current medium or media? What materials are most engaging for you? Is there a specific data set that you're diving into? Where, what's, what's next? Yeah, so I have to say that COVID hit my studio pretty hard. So I had to go into survival mode. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that happened is that I stopped making sculptures. I had to find some other way of, of paying the bills for the space. So I went, uh, I have begun working in 2D. So lots of 2D weavings that are based on weather data and COVID data. So I'm working more and more with COVID data. I'm doing a project with Boston University and their uh, School of Public Health and working with students and COVID data there and trying to find ways of translating that into um, both uh, visual and musical translations. Uh, so that's, I'm very excited about that, working with students because they see things I don't see. So I learned something new. So that's sort of what's cooking and then trying to um, figure out other ways, means to pay the bills for this studio while we get through this pandemic. I can relate. Um, well, Natalie, thank you so much. This has been uh, really amazing. I'm gonna bring back um, our wonderful colleague, Roxy. Um, and uh, uh, we'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, just for everyone who has um, recently tuned in, this is a project of the Living Systems Collaboratory. Um, Natalie uh, Myback is an artist who works at the intersection of art and science. Uh, Roxy here is the uh, founder uh, of Have Ritual and the owner of Have Ritual and one of the co-founders uh, of the Living Systems Collaboratory. Without Roxy, none of this would be happening, I can tell you. And uh, we also want to express sincere thanks to our patron, uh, Mansoor, who has been uh, a, a, a living guiding force behind this whole process. And so, uh, Natalie, we weren't able to get through all the questions by any means, but you've certainly given our participants and also others who are uh, watching the stream on YouTube and Facebook so much to think about, so much inspiration. We'll get through this COVID thing, and I can't wait to see what comes out on the other side from your studio and your wonderful, fertile brain, imagination, and soul. So thank you again for spending the time with us. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank oh, you so thank much, you. Natalie. Bye, everybody, and uh, looking forward to the next installation.